How are you kids doing? Have a good Christmas? Good New Year? All right. Well, I have something, and I'll tell you right off the bat, uh, you don't get these now, but maybe if you come up afterwards, I'll give you a couple. But I'm not going to uh, I'm not get myself in trouble for sugaring you guys up and sending you home, okay? But uh, this morning, we have one of my favorites. What are these? A lot of excitement here for these M&Ms. The uh, family size, good size to have. So if we, um, if we pour these M&Ms out, What colors? Uh, blue, red, yellow, purple. Purple? No purple. They don't have tan anymore. They got rid of tan for some reason and added blue. There are green, but there's, there's one green one in here. So these M&Ms, there's something, something that's, uh, what, what's in the middle of M&Ms? Briley is the only one saying it's disgusting. I don't, I don't understand. Well, I'll eat your share, okay? Actually, if it was Reese's, I would eat your share for sure. That's my weakness. So, chocolate, and uh, what, what color is chocolate typically? Brown. Yeah? So, if I take a knife, and do not, I must warn you, do not do this on your own. Make sure your children are around, but if, or your parents, excuse me, not your children. <laughs> um, but if I cut one of these open... agreement that that is brown. It's not blue, right? So if I cut open, it is not red. Also brown. Surely if I were to, well, hello there. <laughs> yeah, giggle, giggle. Sorry, we're not handing out snacks right now. But um, surely if I were to cut open a green one, it would be green in the middle, right? It's still brown chocolate, right? Yeah. So, even though the colors are all different, and at holidays you can get all sorts of variations of M&Ms, right? Like as far as, yeah, all sorts of colors. The chocolate's the same, right? The middle is the same? Do we go to school? Do we have neighbors? Do we have kids around us that maybe look different than us? You don't have any kids on your street? Well, not really on your street. But um, God makes us all different, right? Yes, he makes us all different. We're all different shapes, sizes, colors. But inside, our hearts are all the same, right? Didn't Jesus say that uh, our hearts are the same? You know, there's even a little song. You may have sung it before. It goes like this. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Maybe we should sing that as a church sometime. Important truths there. But God loves us all, right? We're all very different, but we all have hearts that um, we all need God, right? We all need Jesus. So, I hope this week, or the next time you have an M&M or whatever, that we all need God, right? We're all different. We all act differently. We all look different. But our hearts all need Jesus, right? So, can we love on people like Jesus would this week? Yeah. God loves us all, and I'm thankful for that. God loves each of you, and He has a plan for each of you. We're going to pray, and... Uh, at the end of church, if you want to come up to me, I might give you two M&Ms, but that's, that's as much as we'll do, okay? Let's pray. God, we uh, are thankful that you are a very creative artist and that you made us all very different, but we all have hearts that are the same and hearts that need you, souls that need you. Lord, may we love on our friends this week just like you would have us to. Lord, I'm thankful for these children. I'm thankful for our youth. Thankful for all of our workers that work with them each week. Lord, may they learn more about you each day and learn that you have a great purpose and plan for them. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.
Gosh, I think I want to join a youth class or come to children's time at the very least. I don't have, M&M's and Incredible Pizza have I none, but such as I have to thee I give. So <laughs> that's great. Congratulations, youth. That's wonderful to see that makeover in your room and all the things that were going on. Uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing. Gosh, we're glad to see you today. Quine and I missed you. We haven't seen you since last year. And so uh, we're sure glad to be back with you. Uh, we had a, a wonderful time uh, away. We learned that uh, the one lesson that we learned is that you don't go to San Antonio the week uh, after Christmas uh, or the week of Christmas because the crowds are unbelievable. But we had a, we had a great time, and we, uh, Quinnay and I love the road trips. Many of you know that. Many of you are followers of our road trips on Facebook. Uh, because we love getting in the car and going. Any chance, any, you know, every Sunday morning is a road trip for us. And so every time we have the opportunity to get in the car, we do that, and we're always ready to go. And uh, the Lord has blessed us through the years and allowed us the opportunity to make a lot of little trips like that, and we're so grateful for that because we thoroughly enjoy that time. I like to drive, and she likes to let me drive. So, uh, so we enjoy that time. But we are glad to be back with you. We're kind of glad... We're not kind of glad, but I'm very glad to begin to get back into the routine in more ways than one. Uh, I uh, added a little bit more to myself during the Christmas holiday than I intended to add, and I'm looking forward to uh, uh, get, getting rid of that so, uh, uh, and getting back into uh, a routine of things, back into the study of the Word in the way that I enjoy it so much and back into being with you all week after week. Uh, why don't you take your Bibles this morning if you have them? I hope you have them with you. And open up into, uh, we're getting back into uh, the revelation of Jesus Christ. I'm not sure how far we're going to go into revelation. I've had many people ask me that. Uh, I know, uh, I'm, I'm reasonably certain we're going to venture through chapters 4 and 5 because of the content and how they add on to the series that we've been in. And uh, if the Lord is willing and things go well, we may even go, go beyond that. And the reason I say that is because I love the book so much. I love to study it because there are new things to be learned every time I open the pages uh, of the Revelation. And so we'll see how far the Lord directs me as we, uh, as we go through the Revelation. If I could ask you, would you stand this morning? And we're going to read uh, uh, in Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. We're just going to look at one verse this morning, and I'll explain to you why here in just a few minutes. This is what John writes. It says, After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet, speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after this. Let's join our hearts together as we pray this morning. Father, we are so grateful for the day that you've given to us today. What a wonderful blessing uh, we've received thus far this morning in the singing of uh, the hymns and worshiping you in that way. And Lord, in uh, uh, just the encouragement as a church that we receive, seeing the strength of this youth group, I just pray, Father, that you'll bless their young hearts and draw them closer to your side each and every day. We thank you for our children and the uh, uh, and for the time that they have as they come up and share, it's a very personal time for them. It's a time that includes them in the worship. And, and Lord God, above everything else, we thank you for your word. We pray today that as we uh, enter into this time in studying your word, that you'll show us some new things. Uh, Lord, that you'll teach us some things. And that as a result of being here today, that your word will be multiplied to our hearts and our lives. And as we begin this new year, Father, we'll... Uh, we'll Begin it, uh, if no other reason, with a, a fresh and a new commitment to studying your word every day, to reading it and, and growing closer to you, drawing closer to you in our lives. So I thank you now, Father, and I, I praise you for this day, and Quinnay and I are so grateful for this church and these people. We love them so much and ask that you'll bless the ministry here in the, the days and the weeks and the years to come. We pray all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Thank you all. You may be seated. You remember back uh, uh, the first or second week that we began the series that was entitled Jesus in the Midst of His Church. 
you, uh, you probably re remember that I mentioned back there, I don't remember exactly what week it was, but I know I mentioned it, but you'll probably uh, remember that I mentioned back there that the Revelation is divided up into three different parts, uh, and they're very identifiable. Uh, uh, as a matter of fact, when John, in, in, uh, in chapter 1, verse 19, when John was told to write, uh, he was told this, he said, write uh, the things which thou hast seen, and that was a reference to the first division of Revelation, and it took in chapter 1. It was a reference to everything that uh, John saw, uh, everything that he was told uh, to write down, uh, everything about the fullness of, uh, of Christ in God. All of that was contained in that first division. Uh, then there was the second division of the book of Revelation, which took in chapters 2 and 3, and that's the part in verse 19 where uh, John is told to write the things that are, and he's talking about present. He's not talking about the past. He's talking about present. That includes us today. And, uh, and in that division, uh, it, it's, it's the place where John was instructed to write letters as the Lord uh, gave them. The, the letters were literally from the Lord Jesus Christ, but it was the hand of John who wrote those things down, and then he was instructed to send those uh, seven letters to the seven churches that uh, were in Asia Minor. And, and we remember that all of those churches were actual churches. They really existed, but also that uh, uh, all of those churches gave us a, uh, a picture of the characteristics that could and can be found in every single church that existed not only back then, but exists today. And so we saw that in that second division. And then we come to uh, uh, chapter 4 today, beginning in verse 1. And, and in verse 19 of chapter 1, John went on and he was told to write the things which shall be hereafter. And that was talking about future things. It's chapter, chapter 4, verse 1, and I believe it runs through chapter 22, verse 6, if you read it and understand. After verse 6 of chapter 22, it kind of comes back to the present day with John. And it was a reference to the things that have not happened yet, but they're going to happen. Those things are going to happen. So there are a couple of things that are important for us to consider as we move on in Revelation. John apparently received the entire Revelation in one day. I hadn't really taken the time to think about that, but only one time in the Revelation does it say that it was the Lord's day. It was Sunday when he received this. And the Lord gave him this entire revelation to write down in that one day. Another thing for us to consider, and I feel like this is important as we move ahead, is that uh, the revelation for the most part was written in sequence. In other words, it was written in, in the order uh, that things uh, had happened, were happening, and were going to happen. And that's one of the things that has made the revelation easier for me to understand. Uh, if you don't get confused by the way the Holy Spirit gives it to John, you can see that actually things are occurring in that book in sequence, and they're happening in the same way that they have happened, and they're happening now, and they're going to happen in the future. So we begin this third division uh, in Revelation 4.1. What I want to do is I want to point out uh, the importance of verse 1. Now, the entire book of Revelation is important, but verse 1 of chapter 4 is a pivotal verse, and it's a very powerful verse, uh, because what is being described to us in this verse is it, we're getting the description of John as he is transported uh, from his place on the Isle of Patmos. Now, some people have said, was he transported bodily? I don't think he was. The reason I say that is because it says that flesh and blood will not inherit the kingdom of God. There's no sinful flesh that will ever be in the kingdom of God. So I believe that, uh, that he was caught up in the spirit. I really believe that's what it's talking about here. And what we see in verse 1, it gives us a description of John being transported into heaven where he not only is given glimpses of glory, which by the way is the title of the message for next Sunday, He's not only given glimpses of glory, but he's also shown the events that will take place up until the time that Jesus returns and puts away sin forever and destroys forever the kingdom of Satan and then establishes his eternal kingdom, something that every believer should be looking forward to. 
You know, it is difficult as we look at this. Uh, I, I've read all of the different opinions about this verse of Scripture. I'm settled in my heart what it's saying. And I want to try to express that to you this morning. But uh, it is difficult to read this passage without seeing uh, uh, the parallel between what happened to John here and what will one day happen to all of those who are in Christ Jesus. And I'm speaking of the rapture of the church. I think that in what we see taking place in this one verse, we are seeing as a parallel of something that is going to occur to each and every person who is in here who is in Christ Jesus. And that is called the rapture of the church. Now people have said, well, the word rapture is not in the Bible. Well, it's not in the Bible in the Greek or the Hebrew or any other language. But we're in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 where it says, and I'm going to read this passage here in a little while, where it says we're caught up together. That term caught up is the, uh, is the Latin word rapeo or raptus, and that's where we get our word rapture, just in case you were curious about that. That's where the word comes from. So, beloved, to begin with this morning, what I want to do is I want to approach this verse in perhaps a little bit different way than uh, we might normally approach it. Uh, uh, spending time in prayer and seeking the Lord's uh, will about this single verse of Scripture, what I really desire to do today is I want to plant a seed in each of our hearts so that every time we look at this verse we will be reminded of the importance of it to us. I, I, have, just, I have just three points this morning, and, and if you've got space in the margin of your Bible, I've already written it in the margin of mine. I had to turn my Bible sideways and write it up the page that way because I have terrible handwriting. I'm a lefty, and my handwriting is, is terrible. But I, I, I print is what I do, basically. But if you have room in the margin of your Bible or, or someplace to take notes, I'd like for you to write down these three points this morning because I, I would love for us every time we come across this verse of Scripture that the Lord will have planted in our heart the importance of Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. So let me take these one at a time here. First, every time we look at Revelation 4, 1, it is my prayer that it reminds us of God's unfailing promises. That's the first point. I pray that it reminds us of God's unfailing promises. Notice what it says at the beginning of verse 1. It says, after these things. Well, after what things? Well, after everything that was given to John by the Lord in chapters 1 through 3. Prophetically, these things speak of the period of time from the start of the church at Pentecost until the day when the church will no longer be uh, of effect upon the earth. And, and, beloved, that day is going to come. That day where the church has served the purpose that the Lord intended when He built His church. Uh, the, and I really do think that there is, we're seeing a day that's coming, I don't know when it's going to happen, where the decreasing effectiveness of the church on earth will be due in part to the increasing wickedness in the hearts of men. And we can see that happening all around us every single day. Uh, as a matter of fact, we, we get kind of a glimpse of that in Revelation chapter 3, verse 14, where it talks about the, the final condition of the church just before the Lord comes, the Laodicean church. Nobody wants to be a member of the Laodicean church, remember? Nobody is naming their church the Laodicean church. There's a reason why. The reason is because the condition of the church at that time will be such that it will make the Lord sick at His stomach. What a terrible thing. But not only that, we can also get glimpses from books like the book of Romans, uh, in Romans chapter 1 in particular, where we are shown that uh, we're moving toward that day when even though men will claim to know God, it says in Romans chapter 1 that they'll not be thankful for anything, uh, but they'll become vain in their imaginations, Paul wrote. And he says their foolish hearts will become darkened because of that uh, happening in their hearts. It says that God will begin to give them up and begin to give them over to doing those things that are in their hearts anyway. 
And from that, the result of that will be every kind of vile thing and wickedness and evil that you can even imagine. And aren't we approaching that day? I, I, uh, I'm not going to say that I'm not shocked anymore because I'm shocked every day when I hear the news and I see the things that are taking place in the world around us. And it's all a part of these things that we're mentioning here. Romans also tells us that even the religious folks in those last days, it says that they will have a form of godliness, but they'll deny the power thereof. There will be powerless people sitting in powerless churches, listening to a powerless gospel, and living powerless lives before the Lord Jesus Christ. But the good news is, according to what is I see taking place and being revealed to us here in Revelation 4.1, that in accordance with the Lord's faithful promise, beloved, remember His faithful promise. In accordance to the faithful promises of the Lord, His church, the church, the true church, is going to be removed and brought to Him with such a suddenness that the Apostle Paul described it as being in the twinkling of an eye in 1 Corinthians. Do you know how fast the twinkling of an eye is? I remember wondering what that really meant, and I heard a preacher say once, he said, have you ever looked into the, aisle, into the eyes of a baby and you see that twinkle that is there, and if you don't look very quickly, you'll miss it? Quine and I looked into the eyes of a little baby the other night, and that's, I was looking for that twinkle, and it's there. It's there. It's going to be that fast. The term caught up in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. That term caught up means a violent catching away. So quickly, it will happen so quickly that people won't even realize what's taking place. We call it the rapture of the church. And there's no mistaking that what we're reading here about John parallels that great and future event. Jesus himself, in one of my favorite passages of Scripture, in John chapter 14, Jesus himself promised that that day would come. You remember the disciples were troubled in their hearts because the Lord had, had told them that he was going to the cross to die? And, you, and, and those great words that I have repeated over and over throughout my life, the Lord looking at them and said, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are what? Many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And then he goes on to say, I go away to prepare a place for who? For you, that where I am, there you may be also. So he promised us there that he's coming for us. This isn't talking about the second coming of Christ, because it says in Revelation chapter 1 that every eye shall see him then. The church, that's the only eyes that are going to see him at the rapture because we're going to be caught up together to meet him in the air. Beloved, in accordance with God's unfailing promises, the rapture of the church must take place when? After these things that John writes about here. These things that are recorded in Revelations chapter 1 through 3. After those take place, it has to happen. It has to happen. Oh, there's something else. The second, my second point is there's something else that I pray that we will be reminded of each time we look at this verse. I pray that we'll re be reminded of God's unmistakable personage. I didn't say parsonage. God's unmistakable personage. Believe it or not, that is a word. It talks about the total person, who the person really is, is what it's a reference to. If you look closely at chapter 1, the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are clearly introduced in that chapter to John. As a matter of fact, verse 4 in chapter 1 identifies the one sending the letter to the seven churches of Asia Minor as, as uh, the letter being from Him which was and which is to come, that's speaking of eternal God, from the seven spirits which are before His throne, that's speaking of the Holy Spirit in all of His protection, uh, perfection and fullness, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten from the dead, is talking about what we call the Trinity there. God in all of His fullness. God in all of His personage, if I can use that word. So, in, so here in verse 1 of chapter 4, when John wrote, the first voice that I heard was as it were a trumpet talking with me, 
there is no mistaking whose voice it was that he was hearing. John had heard this once before, and he knew that this was the voice of the Lord that was speaking to him because he identified himself in the same, same way. You know, I remember years ago, and I don't remember where it happened, but I just remember this happening. I remember once a man asked me if I believed that we would know Jesus when we see him for the first time. You, beloved, I want to tell you something. I believe this. I believe if you know Jesus now, you're going to know him then. Amen? It's as simple as that. I believe if you know Jesus, if you know the personage of Jesus Christ now, you're going to know him then. On the other hand, if you don't know him now, you're not going to know him then. And the scripture actually goes on to tell us, if you don't know him then, he won't know you either. You can go into where it talks about the final judgment in Matthew chapter 7, 22, and in there, there is an example that the Lord himself gives us of those who will come before him and say, well, Lord, I knew you. I knew who you were. I did things for you all the time. And the, the Lord will say, who are you? He'll say, I never knew you. Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. So you see, it comes down to the fact if you know him now, beloved, you're going to know him then. As a matter of fact, in 1 Thessalonians 4.16, it tells us this. It says, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trump of God. He's not sending someone else. He's coming himself. He's announcing it himself. He's doing it himself. He's coming and it's his voice that we'll hear. We're going to know him. We're going to know his, his unmistakable personage of Jesus Christ. And that's made evident in this. The same uh, John who uh, wrote Revelation 4.1 also wrote in 1 John 3.2. He said, Beloved, now we are the children of God. And it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know, is what John wrote there. And you know why he could write that? Because John knew. He said, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Christians, the first voice we will hear, make no mistake about it, it will be the personage of Jesus Christ. Unmistakable. And we'll know him. There's good news in that. We see a, a picture of that right here in the example of John that we will know and understand the personage of Jesus Christ. Well, that brings us to the one final thing, that, uh, and this really uh, kind of ties it all together. The one final thing that I hope this verse will remind us of, I hope and pray that when we look at this verse, we'll be reminded of God's unalterable plan, His unalterable plan. Look at the end of verse 1 here. Uh, the words to John are this, come up here. And I will show you things which must be hereafter. Now, there are some key words in that part of the verse, and they kind of jump, jumped out at me as I read them. And the key words are things which must be hereafter. Listen, beloved, when God says something must be, it means that God's plan is unalterable. It cannot be changed. You know, beloved, the Lord showed these things to John so John could show these things to us. This is not a private revelation. John was told in chapter 1, uh, in verse 2, to write these things and, it, and to bear record of the Word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. And then, in verse 3, the Lord Himself proclaimed, Blessed is he who reads, and they who hear the words of the prophecy, and keep those things that are written, for the time is at hand. You see, these are things that cannot be altered. These are things that cannot be changed. These are things that are going to happen. They must happen in exactly the same sequence that God showed them to John. They're unalterable. That's, a, that's God's plan. This verse speaks to us of, I got to thinking about it this week, and I, I tagged this little tag on it. It speaks to us of the imminency of things that must be hereafter. You see, all of our lives, we've heard preachers preach about the return of Christ. All of our lives, we've heard Bible scholars and Christians try to determine when Christ will return. Many of us older ones remember 88 reasons why Jesus will come in 1988. And we're, we were, I wasn't surprised when he didn't. Amen? All of us have 
have heard and have sang the old hymns telling us that Jesus is coming back. And when I look at this verse of Scripture, it reminds me the eminency of things which must be hereafter means that at any given time in history, at any given time in history, we're actually only seven years away from the actual return of Jesus Christ. Did you realize that? At any time in history. What do I mean by that? I mean that after the rapture of the church, there's only seven years left before he returns. There's only seven years left. That's why John wrote this, what he wrote. What we are reading in, in this verse uh, in, in, in chapter 4 is a reminder to us that these things could come to pass at any moment, starting with the catching away of all the believers of all time. First, those who have been in the graves followed immediately by those of us who are alive and remain to the coming of the Lord. We read that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and also in 1 Corinthians 15, 51, where there Paul shows us a mystery where he says we shall not all sleep, and he's talking about death there, but he said we all will be changed, every one of us. He says, in the twinkling of an eye, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And those of us who remain will be caught up together to meet him in the air. What great passages of scripture those are for us. It is, it is God's unalterable plan. It is going to happen and nothing and no one, not even Satan himself, can change God, God's plan. Glory be to God for that. For his promises and his plans. You know, we can look Beloved, at the new year, and I, I, you know, I always start the new year out. It's kind of funny. I've always done this. I always start the new year out just kind of thinking about it, thinking, what's going to happen this year? And ultimately, it always comes to my mind, Lord, will you come this year? And, and all of us, in one way or the other, we, we hope the year will turn out okay. We look at the world around us, and, and it kind of concerns us when we see the things that are going on. Some of us even make New Year's rev resolutions. My resolution every year is not to make any resolutions because I can't keep them anyway. And, there, and it's okay to do that. But the reality of the whole thing is that everything is going to work out in accordance with God's plan. Everything. And, and I, I find a lot of peace in that in my own life, knowing that nothing happens in my life that is outside of the will of God or the knowledge of God. He knows it all. He's planned it all, and he has a reason for it. It's all a part of his plan. And even with that, even knowing those things, believe it or not, there are still those who question whether Revelation 4.1 has a reference to the church being caught away. There are many who don't believe that. Let me give you just a couple of things as we begin to wrap this up this morning to consider about chapter 4, verse 1. First, after chapter 3, verse 22, that's the end of the churches, there's no more mention of the church until Revelation twenty-two sixteen, 16. And back then, you're back to present time again, where John writes that. If we, follow, if we follow the sequence of events in Revelation 4 and 5, and following after that, the logical conclusion is that the church will not be here during the time that we know as the tribulation. And, and the scriptural proof for that is unbelievable in the New Testament. Something else to consider is the events that take place after chapter 4 and 5 uh, are in reference to the time that is called the Great Tribulation. And that's what will start then. And that's the time when Satan is going to be given power to carry out his evil purposes on the earth for seven years. But uh, uh, 2 Thessalonians uh, 2, 1 through 12, make it clear that the devil's plan uh, will not be carried out until the Holy Spirit is gone. And I want to read that passage to you. In uh, Second Thessalonians, or in First Thessalonians, did I say first or second? In uh, First Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians chapter two, I'm sorry. I'm getting first and second Thessalonians confused here. Let me read this to you because this makes it very clear as to when the uh, uh, the Antichrist will be unleashed on the earth. Let me read this beginning in verse one of chapter two. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to Him. He's talking about the rapture there. We ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled either by spirit or by word or by letter as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means for that day, listen to this, 
That day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed. He's talking about a time there where the apostasy in the world grows to such a great degree that the, uh, that the man of sin is revealed. We know him to be the Antichrist. He calls him here the son of perdition, straight out of, of, uh, of the pits of hell, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he sits as, uh, as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. We read this later on in Revelation. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And now you know what is restraining. He's speaking of the Holy Spirit there as the restrainer. And now you know what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. It's, a, it's at work all around us. Only he who now restrains, speaking of the Holy Spirit, will do so until, look at this, until he is taken out of the way. It's speaking very explicitly of the rapture there. And what he is telling us here is that the, the, the evil one, the, uh, Satan himself, will not be unleashed on this earth until the Holy Spirit is taken out. Well, let me ask you something about this. Because there are those who doubt uh, that this is going to happen in this way. When Jesus went away, he told his disciples and he told us, he said, I will not leave you comfortless, I will come to you. And in chapter 16 of the book of John, he said, it's expedient for you that I go away. Because if I go not away, the comforter will not come. And there are a couple other places where Jesus told us, the comforter when he comes, he will be with you and he'll be in you forever. It doesn't make sense to me that the Lord would come and receive the Holy Spirit up and leave the church here. I've heard it said this way. There's no bridegroom that's going to let his, church, his bride be beat up before the wedding. He's not going to leave the church here, beloved. These are unalterable truths that are given by the Lord God. I believe this verse is showing us that the unalterable plan of God is to remove the church from the earth that these things might happen thereafter, as John writes. Oh, Christians, I pray that when we look upon this verse, this, this one verse, that because of God's promise, because His promises are unfailing, that He, he promised us that He's going to come again and receive us unto Himself, and He's not going to go back on His promise. And that His personage, we need to remember His personage is unmistakable. He is God, and He will never be anything less than God. And if you know Him now, you're going to know Him then. And that is, His plan is unalterable. God's plan was written in eternity past to be carried out in the dispensation of time, and nothing or no one or any situation or anything that happens in this world or anything that lies ahead of us, nothing will keep that from happening. Remember Revelation 13, 8, it tells us in there, it describes Jesus as the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. That tells me that God took care of all of it before he even created the world. Thanks be to God. As we close this morning, and I'm going to ask Josh to go ahead and come with the praise team this morning so we can have a time of invitation. As we close this morning, I'd like to give you something uh, for all of us to think about. You know, at some point in time, all of us are going to leave this world. I don't think anyone would argue with me about that. I, I know I've said this before. I love this saying. My wife told me years ago, if the Lord doesn't come soon, none of us are getting out of here alive. And she's speaking truth there. She's speaking truth. All of us are going to leave this world in one way or the other. I remember my very first full-time pastor at First Baptist Church, Southwest City. My, my study was in the bell tower, and I loved that little place because I could get in there, and I had bookcases in there, and other than having to shoot the birds out almost every day, I loved going in that study and shutting myself in. And I still remember the day, I don't remember what passage of Scripture I was looking at, but I still remember the day when uh, the Holy Spirit spoke into my heart, 
Pat, did you realize there's only one of three ways that we're going to leave this world? We're either going to be resurrected, we're going to be raptured, or we're going to be removed. What do I mean by removed? Well, you have to study Matthew chapter 24. Matthew 24 concerns the period that we know as the tribulation, and in particular, it's speaking about Israel. And in there, there is the example uh, where it says it'll be like it was in the days of Noah. When they were going on and carrying on with life, and they did not know until the flood came and they were taken. It's not talking about Noah there. Some people try to paint the rapture into that, and there's no rapture in that passage. Study it. Because the ones that it's speaking of who were taken were those who did not listen to the call that was issued by Noah. Were those who refused to believe in the personage of a personal God. And they were carrying on with life as though nothing was going on and there was no problem until the day that they were taken away. Every one of us is going to leave this world in one of three ways. Either we're going to die before Jesus comes and be placed in the ground and we're going to be resurrected when the trumpet sounds or we're going to be alive and here together when we hear the sound of the trumpet and we're going to, be, and we're going to raise up to meet him in the air. Or, or, or we're going to be that person who refused to listen to the call of the Lord all of our lives, and we're going to be removed, and that removed means removed and taken to the great white throne judgment that we read about at the end of Revelation. How are you going to leave this earth? Resurrected? Raptured? Or removed? As we begin 2020, can you imagine 2020? When Quinnay and I first started dating, we couldn't even fathom 2020. Quinnay didn't even know the Lord then. I knew him at a distance. Yet he, he never let me get away because he's faithful. The faithfulness of his promises, they're unfailing. His personage is unmistakable, beloved. And his plan is unaltered. If you're in Jesus Christ, he has a plan for you. And that plan is that if you die, you're going to be raised one of these days. If you're alive, you're going to be raptured. But he also has a plan that takes in those who reject him. And that plan is going to be one day, he's going to send his angels. And those who have refused him are going to be removed and taken to that great white throne judgment. We have the choice right now. Do you know how you're going to leave this earth? God has given the opportunity. What a great, what a wonderful thing it is that we're still living in the day of grace. Thanks be to God. Because this day is passing away every single day. And one of these days, in the twinkling of an eye, the day of grace will pass us by. While you still have that time, Beloved, if you've never made that decision, you can make it right now, right where you're sitting. You can just, you can bow your head when we pray here in a moment, and you can pray and say, Lord Jesus, I believe in you, and I'm asking you to forgive me in my, of my sins. I believe you died for my sin, and you've been raised from the, from the grave, and you're alive today, and I'm trusting my life into your hands right now, Lord. Just take control. I want to leave this world either through the resurrection or by being raptured up with the church. I don't want to leave it the other way. Beloved, if that's a decision that you would like to make this morning, you can make it right where you're sitting. But let me ask you to take one more step. When we offer this time of invitation, I'd like for you to come down and just take me by the hand and say, Brother Pat, I've made that decision, and I'd like to pray with you this morning and rejoice with you that the Lord, because of his wonderful grace, because of his mercy, because of his faithful promises, because of his unmistakable personage that he's called you to salvation so he may call you to heaven one day. Amen? Let's stand and I want to pray for you this morning. If you have a decision in your heart today, I just call you to come. As we begin this new year, what a great way to start this new year by trusting him as your Lord and Savior. Or believers,
by renewing your faith and rededicating your life to him. That would be a great thing to do as we start this year. Father, we are so grateful and so thankful for your word. Lord, as always, I pray that I have been faithful in bringing the message that you spoke into my heart. Lord God, I pray that you've taken my words and you've made them right in the hearts of the people who are here. That we've all heard what you have to say. And Lord, that we uh, can identify with these things and that every time we revisit this verse of Scripture, I pray that you'll speak these things into our hearts and we'll remember. And we'll realize the significance of this. This, is, this verse marks a turning point in the lives of every man and woman in this world. The turning point from the day of the church and the, the day of grace to the day where the tribulation will enter into the scene and Satan will rule on this earth. So I pray now with thanksgiving, asking Holy Spirit that you speak to our hearts and that you'll move and convict us and bring us to decision today. And that in everything, all of the praise and all of the glory belongs to you. And we pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.